Other members by their surnames. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Minister of Health and Wellness awarded 52 paramedics with a Paramedic Long Service Award during Paramedic Services Week last May. I would like to recognize two of the 52 recipients, two from Digby County. <coughs> they are Odette Gadette of Church Point, who has served 20 years, and Peter Mellet of Matagan, who has 25 years. Both are highly capable paramedics with long years of service, and I congratulate them on the receiving this award. They exemplify the caring professionals who are so important to their patients during an emergency. I would like to thank both of them and all the paramedics for their professionalism, service, and compassion. Thank you. Thank you very much. The time allotted for test the speaker with member statements has just about expired, and we'll now move on to oral questions by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, teachers overwhelmingly rejected the deal made between the Premier and his government and the Nova Scotia Teachers Union Executive, putting the Premier's plan for financial restraint into high doubt, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Premier, what is his plan B to get this all back on track? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to uh, thank uh, the uh, uh, many people who sat down at the table to uh, come out with what it was an agreement that uh, we believed was fair, not only to uh, uh, the teachers, Mr. Speaker, but to all Nova Scotians. It was one that was within the fiscal framework, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to be very clear. Uh, any agreements that we sign will fit within the fiscal framework, uh, and the deal that we had, Mr. Speaker, on the table yesterday was the best deal that is going to be presented, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we certainly understand the need to have a fiscal framework, but uh, there are many people that aren't sure that was the best deal, Mr. Speaker. Thousands of parents uh, and students told the government they want to see real reform in the classroom. We're hearing from many teachers who actually were disappointed that the deal that the Premier's government made with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union Executive traded away real reform in the classroom to try and get into that fiscal framework. Mr. Speaker, now that that deal has been rejected, does the Premier intend to bring back an opportunity for real reforms in the classroom as he moves forward? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to tell this host the major investment this government has made in public education since being the privilege to be a government, Mr. Speaker. We've capped class sizes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've hired more teachers, Mr. Speaker. We've ensured uh, that we made an investment, Mr. Speaker, in learning. We've actually brought in teachers from across the province for the first time to sit down, Mr. Speaker, to talk about curriculum and outcomes. We reduced outcomes from P to 3 by over 200, Mr. Speaker, making, it, making a better working environment for classroom teachers. Ironically, yesterday we had teachers from across our province representing grade 4s and grade 6s do the very exact same thing to look at the curriculum to reduce, Mr. Speaker, to ensure we're focusing on the things that matter to students, that matter to the parents, Mr. Speaker. And I find it ironic, Mr. Speaker, that that member now on one hand is suggesting we were too tough, and now he's complaining we weren't tough enough. What does he want? The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you exactly what we want. We want to see real improvements in the classroom. Parents in Halifax are wondering why their kids go to school in a class of 37. That is happening today, Mr. Speaker. Parents are wondering and students are wondering why the government traded away professional development days to get this deal, which teachers rejected. Teachers are wondering why their classes and their schools are falling apart around them, Mr. Speaker. The government traded that all away in its deal with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union Executive. Many teachers have spoken up and said they want these issues, the classroom experience, the student experience dealt with in an agreement. All of that was thrown out, Mr. Speaker, in a deal that teachers rejected. So, Mr. Speaker, now that's done, and here we are, and the government needs a plan B. If the Premier really wants to see improvements in the classrooms, will he tell this House that those very issues of class size and PD days and the classroom experience will be dealt with before a new agreement is reached? The Honourable Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the gentleman for the question. Uh, I, I want to know if he actually looked at the agreement, Mr. Speaker. There were financial terms associated with that agreement that we believe were fair, Mr. Speaker, to all Nova Scotians. We have a responsibility, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that not only are we investing in public education, that we are, Mr. Speaker, as the most, uh, uh, it is the, the most investment we've made in any program, Mr. Speaker, in public education. I also, Mr. Speaker, though, have to ensure that health care services are where they are, Mr. Speaker, that Nova Scotians expect to receive them in their community. I need to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that vulnerable Nova Scotians are receiving the supports, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member has a bill before this House about the number of Nova Scotians who are going to food banks. We need to be able to balance and invest, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that all Nova Scotians get to experience a quality of life. This agreement was fair to taxpayers, it was fair to teachers, Mr. Speaker, and let me be clear. We continue to say to teachers we're prepared to talk and negotiate about the very things that he's referring to, that whether it's PD days, whether it's about principals in the union or not, Mr. Speaker. This was achieved at the bargaining table. There was give and take. We are disappointed it didn't happen, Mr. Speaker. But let me be clear. This government will continue to see education as a priority, but we will also live within our fiscal framework. Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Official, pardon me, the Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last night teachers across this province convincingly voted against this Liberal government's most recent contract offer. So, Mr. Speaker, it appears another group of hard-working Nova Scotians has grown tired of this Premier's heavy-handed tactics. Mr. Speaker, teachers in our province work hard, they're highly qualified, and they want what's best for their students in the classroom. And they deserve an opportunity to sit down with the government and have their concerns addressed in a fair and reasonable manner. Mr. Speaker, last night after the vote, the Premier stated, and I quote, we have options now to contemplate. So my question for the Premier is this. What options is he now contemplating? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to replace the $65 million that she was part of cutting out of classroom. As I said, Mr. Speaker, as I said, Mr. Speaker in a statement to the Honourable Member across the way, the leader of the Conservative Party, Yesterday, we had teachers representing grades four to six across our province in working with the Department of Education to reduce, Mr. Speaker, the outcomes that are expected by teachers across this province to make sure that we're focusing on the things that matter. We're listening to teachers to ensure that the working environment, Mr. Speaker, is what they want it to be. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we only have so much money. Each member of that host just stood up talking about wanting more and more investment, Mr. Speaker, to community organizations across this province. If we continue to do what they want us to do, Mr. Speaker, this province would be bankrupt. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, all we're asking for is that people who provide important public services be shown some respect by their government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, time and time again, this province has, this Premier has shown an unwillingness to engage in meaningful negotiations with our public sector workers. Mr. Speaker, we see a government that does not listen and does not consult with Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, home care workers, nurses, health care workers, university students, faculty, staff, and people in the screen industry have all experienced the heavy hand of this government, Mr. Speaker. So my question to the Premier is this. Why will he not engage in meaningful collective bargaining with Nova Scotian teachers? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. That's exactly what we did, Mr. Speaker. We put a proposal on the table. Let me tell you, it's three zeros and two ones. Mr. Speaker, we froze a long service award at current years and current salary, Mr. Speaker. What we did when we negotiated with the, with the unions, Mr. Speaker, we changed that bargaining pattern, which happened at the table. It went zero, zero, one, one and a half, and point five at the end of year four. Mr. Speaker, the long service wards would have been frozen at the number of years, but would have been paid out on retirement salary. That wasn't something, Mr. Speaker, we brought to the bargaining table. It was something, Mr. Speaker, that was negotiated at the bargaining table. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I will say one thing, Mr. Speaker. At least the Nova Scotia Teachers Union allowed their members to vote. Let's hope the Nova Scotia Government Employees Union allows their members to have a vote. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party on our final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this Premier just doesn't get it, you know. For the teachers who voted against this contract yesterday, 
They say it's not about the money, Mr. Speaker. It was about the threats by the government. It was about the disrespect from the government. It was about the lack of action by this government to deal with the pressing problems that teachers face on a daily basis in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, my question for the Premier is this. The Premier has indicated he has a framework for legislation to impose wage freezes on teachers and other public sector employees. Could he please share that framework with members of this legislature, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, that's the same member that introduced legislation to take away the right to strike from paramedics, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Speaker, let me tell you, we're going to continue to do what we've done from the very beginning is focus on kids in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. It's why we've continued to invest in public education, Mr. Speaker. It's why we've capped class sizes, hired more teachers, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's why we continue to believe in public education. We believe in the good work that teachers are doing across this province. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when we reached out to the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, it wasn't us, Mr. Speaker, who brought the people to the table to represent teachers. It was the union, Mr. Speaker, that went out to get a chief negotiator, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps you spent too much time, Mr. Speaker, listening to the other union leadership and not enough time listening to our own membership, Mr. Speaker. But at the end of the day, we negotiated with the people they brought to the table a reasonable, fair deal. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the only person that listened to the Nova Scotia Teachers Union leadership was the Premier of Nova Scotia, who traded away any real chance of reform in our classrooms to try and set a wage pattern. Mr. Speaker, now he has neither a wage pattern nor reform in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. That's disappointing to the thousands of parents that told his government they wanted to see change in the classroom, to the students that go to our schools, and now we know it's disappointing to many teachers who also were in favor of making change in the classroom that were not included in the deal the Premier reached with their own union, Mr. Speaker. So let's ask the Premier, why didn't he insist on real classroom reform as part of the deal he made with the teachers' union leadership? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to again remind him as part of the agreement that was yesterday, Mr. Speaker, that was put before teachers. Uh, it was a program to constitute a, a committee that had equal representation from the union and from the department. Uh, to look at a, a number of pieces of the action plan that the union wanted more discussion, more conversation with teachers uh, to come to a resolution. But let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, we didn't wait. We continue to change the environment in the classroom by capping class sizes, Mr. Speaker, hiring more teachers, Mr. Speaker. We reduced outcomes. Mr. Speaker, by engaging teachers across this province, we've reduced outcomes from P to 3, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, we were doing the exact same thing with teachers, representing grades 4 to 6 across this province, Mr. Speaker. We're not standing still, Mr. Speaker. We're working with classroom teachers to infect the learning environment that Nova Scotia children are in, and we're doing it in a positive, effective way. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, worse than standing still, the Premier traded away the real reforms that parents and students and many teachers now say they wanted, like PD days, Mr. Speaker, like class sizes in the later grades, Mr. Speaker, like the classroom working conditions, like student achievement, like report cards that matter to parents. Those were all things in the action plan that got traded away at the table with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union Executive, Mr. Speaker. Now even teachers say they went too far when they traded those things away, Mr. Speaker. Sure, they're going to have a committee now, but the government has burnt its relationship with our teachers and traded away any interest in making those things happen. So how can the parents and students of Nova Scotia trust this government now to make any real change in the classroom when they were prepared to trade it all away? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the Honourable Member that in public schools across this province, report cards were changed two years ago, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with the support and help of teachers, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the Honourable Member of public education schools across this province, outcomes from P to 3 were changed, Mr. Speaker, based with working 
with teachers, Mr. Speaker. I want to tell the honourable member that yesterday, in this province, sitting with the teachers four to six, Mr. Speaker, we were looking at outcomes to reduce them, so we focused on the things that matter, Mr. Speaker, to students and families across this province. I also want to remind the honourable member that when we had the good fortune and privilege of becoming the government of this province, there were over 40 addition and alterations in front of the Department of Education. We invested in that infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. There are two remaining, Mr. Speaker. That's not only an investment in the classroom, it's an investment to the physical environment that our children are in and that teachers are in, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to provide and invest in kids across this province, Mr. Speaker, and we'll do so in the fiscal framework that we have laid out. The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. After reaching a tentative agreement with the NSTU last month, the Minister said, We have 10,000 teachers who deserve to have a contract. I will table that, Mr. Speaker. And, well, Mr. Speaker, given that there are 10,000 teachers without a contract, my question for the Minister is this. Is she committed to returning to the bargaining table to ensure that teachers in Nova Scotia get a negotiated contract? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I certainly don't need somebody to table uh, to remind me of what I've said. Teachers in this uh, province do deserve a contract. We sat down with the teachers' union to try to negotiate a contract. The teachers' union and the government came to a tentative agreement. They put that out to the teachers. It was the teachers who rejected that. But I do want to say to the member opposite and to everyone in this House, teachers do deserve a contract, and we will work with them to make sure they have one. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Actually, I didn't hear in that answer whether she is actually committed to returning to the bargaining table to ensure teachers get a, a, a negotiated contract. Uh, Mr. Speaker, teachers from across the province are expressing concern that the education reforms being sought by the province are not addressing the issues that affect everyday life in the classroom. In fact, we're hearing about too many children in classes and not enough support. So. I've been saying for months now that teachers are telling me that they've not been consulted meaningfully about these reforms, and now we're hearing that the teachers are actually feeling bullied by the government. So my question for the minister is this. Order, please. It's unparliamentary to infer that the government is bullying anybody. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, that the teachers are feeling pushed around by this government. My question for the Minister is this. How does she plan to deal with the disconnect between the current reform process and the everyday experience of teachers in the classroom? The Honourable Minister of Education. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would go back to the comment that the member made. Uh, teachers had concerns about, quote, too many children in the classroom. Mr. Speaker, that is what capping a class size means. We are addressing too many kids in the classroom. Thank you. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Pickrow West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Public Service Commission. We hope um, all Nova Scotia's uh, public service is able to attract and retain the highest quality of workers. And in order to do that, it is important that the government is able to hire individuals within a reasonable period of time. Otherwise, we risk losing those individuals to other opportunities, either locally or unfortunately sometimes out of province. So can the minister update the House on the average time it takes to fill vacant positions in the public service? The Honourable Minister responsible for the Public Service Commission. Mr. Speaker, when we're filling positions in the public service, we don't put a time frame on it. We look for the qualified right candidate to fill that position to deliver services to Nova Scotians on behalf of government. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government plans to open more jobs for young Nova Scotians who have little or no job experience, and I applaud them for that. However, however, I have some concerns that many of those young people may be recent graduates who have no steady or sustainable income, making it much uh, difficulty for them to wait too long for a call back on a job application. So can the minister inform the House the average time period period that is expected to fill those jobs earmarked for those young people. The Honourable Minister of the Public Service Commission. Mr. Speaker, we don't plan on opening jobs for youth. We already have. We've already hired youth into the public service, Mr. Speaker. 
Ever since our government's come to power, Mr. Speaker, over 1,000 youth have entered the public service. Mr. Speaker, we've also taken out, taken out the, the requirement for anyone joining the public service to have two years' experience. That was this government, Mr. Speaker. Up until this government changed that requirement, anybody joining the public service had to have two years of experience. That eliminated every single new graduate out of colleges or universities in this province. Mr. Speaker, we have youth in the public service right now we can point to that would not have been eligible to work here before that was taken out by this government. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question through you is to the Minister of Health. Mental health services in this province are in crisis, and we've heard too many stories from families who are struggling to get the care that they need. Now, last Wednesday here in this House, uh, the member for Halifax, Shabakto, said the department would be spending more than $270 million on mental health services this fiscal year, and I'll, I'll table that in case he forgot. Uh, according to both the Provincial Budget Business Plan and the Nova Scotia Health Authority, that's not true. In fact, the entire amount allocated to mental health is $122.3 million short of that number. So why is there such a large discrepancy on how much money that has been allocated for mental health service delivery? Can the Minister reconcile uh, that statement? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, obviously uh, the Department of Health uh, has, a, has a budget to deliver an, uh, an array of uh, uh, programs across the province. We also know that there, there used to be nine uh, district uh, uh, budgets for, uh, for the clinical, for the operational uh, side of, uh, of mental health. And uh, we know that the Provincial Health Authority is also uh, involved with, uh, with part of that $270 million that will go out for mental health uh, in this fiscal year. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the provincial budget, $111.2 million was allocated for mental health services through the Provincial Health Authority. So the Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis determined that the indirect and actual costs of mental health services amounts to more than six times the annual budget for those services. Even more startling, the report projected the cost of mental health that would increase by $1.5 billion by 2041, and I'll table that as well. Uh, the member from Halifax, Shabukto, also emphasized during his speech that not everything is about the money. While we agree with that, it is clear that the enormous gap in services is, re is related to budget cuts and priorities in mental health care delivery. So my question to the minister, will the minister agree to look into the funding breakdown and clarify with the health authority and the IWK exactly what the budget uh, uh, st st stays at $25 million less uh, than the department's? So again, can the minister... Uh, quantify the amount that this difference uh, is, uh, is qualifying for them. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, that certainly can be uh, can be obtained for uh, uh, for the member. Uh, what I'm pleased about, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that uh, in uh, in August uh, we gave an update on the Together We Can uh, strategy, uh, and I'll table that uh, for the House. There was also uh, additional information about uh, how uh, additional mental health personnel have been added. Uh, uh, over and above uh, what the uh, what the strategy was uh, projecting uh, in its uh, inception, so I'll table that uh, for the House. The Honourable Leader for the New Democratic Party. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, CBC reported that the government's new super board is limiting doctors from working in walking clinics. A document distributed to, to doctors at a recent meeting in the Halifax area indicated that the request for new physicians to work in walk-in clinics will most likely be denied. So I'd like to ask the Minister, why does the Minister feel that new physicians should be denied permission from his new health authority to work in walk-in clinics? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what I can say is that uh, in, the, in the first presentation, uh, there was, in fact, uh, uh, incorrect uh, uh, information that was provided uh, to residents. Uh, Dr. Harrigan is meeting with all residents to make sure uh, that from the Provincial Health Authority uh, there is absolutely uh, clear information on the path uh, forward. Uh, yes, uh, in the Health Authority will go through a period of transitioning uh, to, uh, to uh, moving towards more collaborative practices versus walk-in clinics.
The Honorable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, and I know uh, Nova Scotians, and we support uh, we support those collaborative clinics. But by changing guidelines and restricting access to walk-in clinics and credentialing physicians for that, I believe is the wrong approach. The government hasn't announced uh, or, or uh, announced any new uh, collaborative clinics. Uh, why would the government have those uh, guidelines looked at at this point before even opening uh, a new CEC or new uh, walk-in clinics around the province? Uh, would it not be more beneficial? beneficial to ensure that we recruit those newly uh, graduated medical students prior to changing rules or guidelines and can the minister give a, an indication if uh, if they are going down that route where we'll be limiting uh, physicians uh, credentials in uh, certain areas especially walk-in clinics the honorable minister of health uh, thank you very much uh, mr speaker uh, what we can get from uh, a whole number of sources uh, on uh, on data of the number of doctors that are available to work in walk-in clinics, uh, work in collaborative practices, uh, uh, work in uh, uh, clinics and places like the Cobequid uh, Health Centre, is that we have the second highest per capita doctor ratio right here in HRM. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question, uh, again, through you, is to the Minister of Health. Uh, we know that Syrian refugees set to arrive in Canada will be either privately sponsored or sponsored by the federal government. We do know, however, that providing services such as health care is the responsibility of the provincial government. The federal minister of health has indicated that it is possible that some refugees will, with infectious diseases will be admitted to, uh, to Canada, and I'll table uh, that story as well. Has the minister of health had discussions with the federal health minister and Nova Scotia public health professionals in order to ensure that refugees get the treatment that they require once they arrive here in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, a month and a half to two months uh, uh, before the refugees uh, uh, knew would be coming to Nova Scotia, uh, we actually opened uh, a clinic uh, at, uh, at, the, uh, at the ISANS uh, Centre uh, that will help facilitate uh, some of that uh, early medical examination that will uh, need to go on. Uh, we've also uh, had conversations with the federal health minister and uh, finally uh, the medical support uh, for refugees coming to any province in Canada is now being picked up by the federal government which the previous uh, conservative government had dropped for refugees coming to the country. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. I thank the Madam Minister for, uh, for that answer. While many of those Syrian refugees will be welcomed to Nova Scotia, uh, they'll have experienced war, and the loss of loved ones, and prolonged dislocation. Such trauma may contribute to mental illness and additional demand for mental health services in areas in Nova Scotia. These individuals, like all Nova Scotians, deserve to have timely access to a responsive mental health system. So many people living in Nova Scotia have already tried to tell this government that the system is in crisis already without the added burden. So would the minister inform this House of his plan to address the potential mental health needs of these refugees? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, th there's no question that the, uh, that the member opposite uh, is working from uh, the wrong premise. Uh, he needs to look at, in fact, how we've expanded mental health services uh, in the province. Uh, at the IWK now, not only do we have a world-class facility in the Grand Centre, but we also have a world-class team that are, that are working there. And uh, I know that as, uh, as refugees uh, go across the province, and that's the real advantage to the movement of refugees in Nova Scotia, they won't be here in one hub, uh, they'll be spreading across Nova Scotia, and we'll have the array of services uh, uh, that they need uh, to adjust quickly. I look at a couple of the families that have come just in the last months. They're in school, they're getting great support, and the member opposite does need to check his facts. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Natural Resources. And the question is a simple one. Is there a firewood shortage in Nova Scotia or not? The Honourable Acting Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, um, the department does work to uh, 
evaluate the, the, the situation when it comes to firewood. It is a priority for us to ensure that Nova Scotians have access to that, uh, to that important energy source, Mr. Speaker. We do not have a direct impact necessarily on the marketplace and what's available, but we do consistently work with our, our uh, partners in the private sector to ensure the best flow of fiber possible in the province. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and there's certainly a great number of people around the province that are having a hard time sourcing firewood. So I believe there is a firewood shortage, but I'll ask the Minister again, does the Minister believe there's a firewood shortage in Nova Scotia, yes or no? The Honourable Minister, Acting Minister of Natural Resources. Well, I mean, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite always positions himself as the resident expert on any topic. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll take him at his word. Um, I do not think... I do not think at this particular point, Mr. Speaker, it would be fair um, or precise to speculate on that nature. We still have a lot of the season left um, to evaluate, and we will continue to do that. And, of course, always working with our partners in the private sector to ensure that there is a, there is a flow to the best of our ability so that people are able to heat their homes this winter. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, when the Minister of Community Services was asked by the media why she wasn't prepared to conduct any further consultations in relation to matters before law amendments, she referred to the Law Amendments Committee saying, I, I don't understand that legislative process. I don't need to as a minister. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why she believes that as a minister she does not need to understand the law amendments process? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you very much, and I'm sure this is a question that that member will never have to grapple with, but... <laughs> When, you, when, you're, when, you, when you're a minister, your work stops when your bill reaches the law amendments process. What happens in that room, you're not privy to, you're not in the room, you're not in the committee. Uh, so I, I rely on my colleagues to, to do the work of the law amendments, which we do a fantastic job. So at that point in time, I don't need to know what happens in law amendments until a bill comes back to this house or it goes back to the department. Double member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to draw the minister's attention to yesterday's Hansard. Yesterday, during question period, when responding to a question by the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the Premier said, and I will table that, he said, let me tell you how law amendments committee works. People come in and make presentations, and the committee members listen. It seems, Mr. Speaker, that it is not the Leader of the Opposition who needs to be instructed on how Law Amendments Committee works. It is the Ministers of this Government. Mr. Speaker, why does the Minister believe that it is not her job to listen and respond to the concerns of Nova Scotians at Law Amendments? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Quite frankly, if that's all the member of Dartmouth South has on the consultation process that happened with CFSA, she need not rise in this house. We had a year of consultation. We had tons of consultation with the Aboriginal community, with the communities that deal with children and care. It was about the protection of children. Law amendments has a process that I am not participatory in as a minister. The bill came back to the department. We worked on amendments. It went back. Back, they were passed. It comes back to the Committee of the Whole. And like I said before, I don't think she's ever going to have to worry about that process as a minister. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is also to the Minister of Community Services. The 2015 report card on child and family poverty in Nova Scotia released last week contains alarming statistics. The percentage of children living in poverty in 2013 is still 24.3% higher than it was in 1989. In 1989, Nova Scotia had the fifth highest child poverty rate. By 2013, it was the third highest provincial child poverty rate and the highest rate in the land of Canada. We had lost ground relative to other provinces. Will the minister admit that these statistics mean that many Nova Scotia children don't always get enough to eat? 
The Honorable Minister of Community Services. I thank the uh, member for the question. Uh, in 2013, even with incremental changes in, in child ta in uh, in the benefit reform or the benefit package in Nova Scotia, we still find families struggling every day. We understand that. I know how difficult it is to make ends meet on a very limited budget, whether you're on income assistance or whether you're the working poor. Um, we work with community organizations every day to provide the basic necessities for children uh, throughout every community in this in this in this province. Uh, benefit reform will address many of those issues. I'm looking forward to the federal contribution through the child tax benefit. We know that it takes many different partners to eradicate child poverty, and we're dedicated to working with those partners. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for that question. Shockingly, young children in Cape Breton, in the Cape Breton Census area, had a poverty rate of 42.7%. The child poverty rates are highest in the Cape Breton Census area, where astonishingly, one in three children, 32.4%, are living below the after-tax low-income measure. So my question to the Minister is, will the Minister commit to using her power at the Cabinet table to spur on the economy so the people of Cape Breton and all of Nova Scotia have better access to jobs and food as part of a comprehensive, concerted effort to help families who are living in poverty? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for, for thinking I have power at the Cabinet table. God love him. <laughs> I have power at the Cabinet table. What, we, I just recently returned from Cape Breton, and we've made many, many investments in different organizations that really work on the ground with the Cape Breton Resource Family Center, with Clifford Street Youth Outreach, which is in the, in the members' riding. He knows the work that I've done with them. And we've also worked with the Whitney Pier Boys and Girls Club, an epic um, uh, 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 educational program as well, because we know the at-risk component for children in Cape Breton. We've made significant investments in organizations that work on the ground with them to help families that are in crisis through food security, financial uh, uh, literacy, uh, crisis intervention, parenting and coping strategies around um, uh, children and, and problems within families. Uh, so Cape Breton uh, really has been quite a focus over the last couple of months within our department. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My next question is the Minister of Business. Statistics Canada recently released unadjusted regional unemployment data that shows Cape Breton has the third highest unemployment rate in all regions of the country. Meanwhile, the job vacancy rate by region has Cape Breton as the third lowest in the country. <clears throat> this means that all regions of the country, Cape Breton has the third highest rate of unemployment, third lowest job rates, va rate vacancy. What does the Minister have to say to the people of Cape Breton who are losing hope to build a better future at home? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, as my colleague would know, uh, the process of running economic development in the past has not worked. The Department of Business has embarked on a new journey to engage the private sector. The private sector have told government, get out of the way and let us lead. We're fulfilling that, uh, the, the, the components of that discussion, Mr. Speaker, and uh, certainly aware of the challenges that exist in Cape Breton, and we continue to work with our colleagues and partners in Cape Breton to ensure that Cape Breton and Cape Bretoners have equal opportunity to participate in the economic development of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. In the last five years, Cape Breton has lost 4,600 full-time jobs. The labor force has dropped by 9,200, 9, and the population has dropped by 6,500. The population drop is the single worst region in the country. The first Ivany goal is the average net gain of 1,000 working persons per year. Will the minister get serious about growing Cape Breton instead of cutting and see that Cape Breton can no longer be ignored? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to assure my colleague uh, that Cape Breton is not being ignored. We, we work with all of our partners across the province. But I do want to share, Mr. Speaker, I do want to share with my colleague, for his information, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business just recently released in a report October of 2015. For the first time in months, small business confidence took an upward turn in, in October with optimism indexes rising in Nova Scotia to a nation-leading 68 percent, Mr. Speaker. I want to share with my colleague, things are changing in Nova Scotia. I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. 
Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Community Services was asked about her decision to eliminate the subsidy provided to Brunswick Street, Street nonprofit and the pending eviction of 80-year-old Shirley Joyce. The Minister uh, appear, attempted to deflect her responsibility in this matter by stating that Shirley could bring her case forward to the Residential Tenancies Board. Mr. Speaker, given the Minister's professional history, I, I believe she understands the limitations of the Residential Tenancies Board, and the Board has no authority to reinstate the funding cut by the Minister. Mr. Speaker, what is the Minister prepared to do to ensure that Shirley will not be evicted and can stay in her home of 30 years? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you for that uh, question, because it allows me to clarify the misinformation that came out from the NDP caucus yesterday in which I was shocked and appalled that they actually didn't get it right. Um, subsidies are not cut by any government in, in the provincial sphere, whether it's an MB, NDP government, a Conservative government, or a Liberal government. Subsidies, no, subsidies actually are linked to CMHC mortgages. When your mortgage is paid, your subsidy ends. It's a federal program. It happened to me at Alice Housing. I didn't make a release and blame the NDP for it because that would be misleading and erroneous. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, the Minister is avoiding the reason Shirley received an eviction notice in the first place and avoiding her responsibility in this matter. The Minister was providing a subsidy to Brunswick Street nonprofit and made the decision this summer to eliminate it. As a result, Shirley's rent increased and she was unable to afford the home she has lived in for 30 years. Mr. Speaker, an 80-year-old woman is 13 days away from being evicted, and the Minister has the authority to stop it. I will ask, Mr. Speaker, what is the Minister prepared to do to ensure that Shirley will not be evicted? The and Honourable Minister of Community Services. I met with, with the tenants of the Brunswick Street uh, uh, Housing Cooperative, and I met with the, the, the residents of the Harbour Street uh, Harborview uh, Tenants Association yesterday. Let me make it crystal clear. This government did not cut any subsidy. It expires when a mortgage is paid off. Let me make that clear. But I am willing to work with tenants so that they're not displaced through rent supplements so that women like, like what you're speaking of don't have to face eviction, do not have to uh, worry about where they're going to live in safe, affordable housing in a very short period of time. I've offered that help. It's misleading to say this government cut that subsidy. She knows it. I know it. Stop saying it. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Energy. Um, as we know, uh, offshore oil, ex oil and gas exploration uh, creates a little bit of controversy wherever it tends to happen. Uh, we're hearing a lot from local fishermen, local fish plant owners about the uh, shell uh, exploration that's going on right now in the Shelburne Basin. Um, Sometimes it's hard to figure out what's, what's real science and what's just hearsay. So my question to the minister is, can he give us a little update on what's going on in the, uh, the offshore exploration that Shell's doing? Honourable Minister of Energy. The speaker, uh, the member would be familiar with the Canada-Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board, which is a joint venture between the province of Nova Scotia and the Government of Canada, on which we have members and staff with the expertise necessary to be able to look at what type of drilling activity is taking place on our offshore. Uh, Nova Scotia has a very proud history over many years of being able to do drilling and exploratory work in our offshore in a very safe manner, not only safe for the environment, but safe for the men and women who work in our offshore. We rely upon the board to be able to make those decisions for us put in the necessary conditions and the necessary restrictions to ensure that any activity taking place in our offshore is done so in a prudent and safe manner. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and as the Minister also knows, uh, some of the controversy has revolved around the issue of the capping stack. In case there's a blowout, uh, the availability of that capping stack uh, actually sits in Norway rather than anywhere in North America. And the issue of dispersants. So if there's a blowout, what kind of dispersants? are using what that effect uh, is on uh, the environment, the fish uh, around that, that uh, area and where that, 
where that dispersant might flow uh, because of the currents in that area. So um, maybe it's a further clarification of the issue of, of blowout, capping stacks, and dispersants uh, to try to appease the, uh, the questions of the fishing industry. The Honourable Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, when the opposition uh, asked to have both Shell and the Canadian Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board appear before the Resources Committee, uh, we did so as efficiently as possible and tried to accommodate the schedules of the opposition parties in order to find a time where that meeting could take place. In fact, that meeting was extended to allow even more time to have as many questions asked as possible. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, we rely upon the Canada Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board to have the necessary expertise to look at questions such as blow-up preventers, uh, the use of dispersants and others. Uh, the fact is that since the Macondo disaster, there's been a tremendous amount of knowledge that has been gained from that, safety protocols that have been put in place, uh, the fact that we haven't seen uh, another disaster of that type, uh, the fact that they do have the necessary safety protocols. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, I believe it's important that we rely upon the experts and while it's important to raise concerns, which is le very legitimate, it's also important to make sure that members get the facts so that they can give those back to their constituents to address their concerns. The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have the honour and pleasure of being a member of the Legislature's Law Amendments Committee. But, Mr. Speaker, over the last number of days, in fact, the last number of months, I can say it's been anything but a pleasure to watch how this government has failed to consult in a most basic manner on the bills that they're bringing before this House. Nor has it been a pleasure to witness this government ignore the opinions of Nova Scotians day in and day out. Will the Minister of Community, Culture and Heritage please outline exactly what consultation he did with municipalities prior to introducing Bill 118? The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, listened to stakeholders at law amendments. We've uh, made changes based on what we've heard. Thank you. The, the Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, well, the senior solicitor for the Halifax Regional Municipality actually came into law amendments on Monday to tell us that they had not been consulted on Bill 118 and that the changes City Council explicitly requested were nowhere to be found in the bill. So could the Minister please assure us that this bill is supposed to protect and preserve heritage and explain why he allowed such a glaring omission to be present in a bill that he put forward for the consideration of this house. <clears throat> Is this the Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. It's already gone through. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, my department received 14 direct submissions from all municipalities. HRM provided us with a 50-page document for that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabad Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. Um, I really appreciated the answers that, uh, that you gave a moment ago with respect to that lady that's, uh, that may be evicted, I guess, from her place. Um, I'm always concerned about the individuals that might fall through the cracks. Um, is there something available for her, uh, a fund, uh, whatever the case may be, to help her get resettled again? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the question. Uh, one of the first and foremost things we try to do in Housing Nova Scotia is work with the nonprofits and the cooperative organizations that have nonprofit and safe, affordable housing throughout the, uh, the province. Oftentimes, we're funding partners within that. Um, when nonprofits like 
the two that we're referring to, and, and even the nonprofit that I ran for a number of years runs into sustainability problems. Uh, we can look to Housing Nova Scotia to come in and try to, to look through the slate and the queue of, of uh, uh, a wide range of federal programs that may be able to help them out. If that doesn't work, then we are able to offer rent supplements for, for individuals so that they can be settled in a private market setting so that, that there's the least amount of dis, dis upheaval and, and uh, um, confusion in their lives because we know it's very stressful on tenants when they're caught in that situation. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, again, I'm just, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Minister, uh, is there something that will take place in the next couple of weeks for this lady through the Department? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I met with both leaders of the Tenancy Association yesterday from both of those uh, organizations. Uh, we're committed to working with them. Unfortunately, the, the Board of Directors for both places are not working with their tenants' associations, so that puts uh, the tenants right in the middle of, of where, quite frankly, they shouldn't be. Uh, we are committed. I'm committed. Uh, the CEO uh, of, of Housing Nova Scotia is committed to working with them, meeting with them, and making sure that each tenant's needs are met. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, just a quick one uh, to the Minister of Justice. Uh, we hear often, Mr. Speaker, of phone scams, and every seems every week I pick up a local paper at home, you hear about another scam that's being uh, uh, often targeted at seniors. Um, my question, I, we know that organizations, uh, like for instance the Kings County Crime Prevention, they provide a great defense by educating people to avoid communication with potential scammers. Um, what support is the minister providing community crime prevention groups to support them in their efforts uh, in this regard? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that's a very good question. We do have, a, as you know, a public safety division within the Department of Justice, and we do a lot in the education side for, for protecting the public. On the specific question of a group like the Kings County Crime Prevention, I would have to get back to you on the exact uh, support and in what, what means that it's made, but we keep public safety and, the, and helping in the education of the public so that we know how to protect ourselves. We keep that Order, very please. high on time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just before the Opposition House Leader calls business for this afternoon, I would like to make an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the gallery today are a number of people who are here to see the debate this afternoon. They are Henry Vissers, who is known to many members of this House from the Federation of Agriculture, Marlene Huntley from Horticulture Nova Scotia, and I'm pleased to invite them along with Nick Jennery of Feed Nova Scotia, all three doing important work in our province. I'd like uh, all members of the House to join me in welcoming them to the proceedings this afternoon. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can you call private members' public bills for second reading? Now call private members' public bills for second reading. Can you call Bill Number 121, Fighting Hunger with Local Food? We'll now call Bill Number 121, Fighting Hunger with Local Food. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased uh, that our